Okay, new, new topic, all right. When it comes to training, we, and for that matter, the four fields, what we've got here and what we've just gone over is content. Content, right? What we've really got in the four fields is a script that you can follow. Tools and content to help them become effective. Things to, for when we talk about knowing, being, doing, the content is for their mind, the tools for their hand. Ultimately, the obedience will lead to a being change of heart as they abide and as they are obedient. That said, the question of content delivery and the process of making disciples also matters. Content doesn't create movement. Right? Content doesn't create movement. One of the reasons we've always been very cautious about the, the training materials that we package and put out there is that man constantly defaults, seeing things on a page, constantly defaults to content dump as discipleship. That's not discipleship. That may grow what we know, but discipleship, in fact, maturity, abiding, however you want to describe it, is really the balance between what we know and what we do. There's been times in my life when I knew a hundred things and I was obeying one. That's not maturity. And yet my heart, even my desire for education, pushes me toward this ratio quite often. This isn't what our goal is, the one-to-one -one correspondence, what we know and what we do. So how do we actually pursue that balance that we call, that we call New Testament discipleship, the path to maturity? Well, there's a process. If this is our content, there's a process by which we disciple, right? We introduce content and we hold people accountable and empower them to do it. So that process, that mechanism for discipleship is T for T. That's training for trainers, okay? Described, introduced by Steve Smith and Ying Kai's book there in China. We as an organization spent years misunderstanding when we heard T for T, we thought the lessons that he could email us that were on paper, content. T for T is not content. Plug any content into it. Plug Leviticus 17 into it if you want. I don't know what Leviticus 17 is. I should probably be careful. The point is there's a mechanism, a process by which we disciple people. So to understand T for T, we talk about a three-thirds process. Now, I'm going to describe it a little different than Steve did in his book. I'll present it the way I did the last day and a half. Okay? So when we disciple, any time we meet with our disciples, that could be in a formal setting or it could be in a car ride. As we have time, we constantly want to think through three parts or three-thirds of our time that ultimately are the process of disciple-making, okay? The first third, a lot of people describe it as looking back. The first third of our time, our first agenda in disciple-making, I'm going to refer to it as pastoral care and accountability. Pastoral care and accountability. It's not just how many did you lead to faith, how many did you, how many churches did you start, but rather how to go. And we're looking back, whatever lesson we dealt with the previous time we were together, we're going to ask questions. Maybe that lesson was on prayer. Maybe we set a goal that we would pray daily for the lost in our family, our oikos list. So I would start my time with my disciples saying, did you pray? How'd it go? You forgot on Tuesday and Thursday? That's okay. Did you set your alarm? Did you go through the action plan to remember to pray for those lost people? What, what was the breakdown? Hey, by the way, any signs of health or growth? Any signs of an answer to those prayers? Uh, Uncle Johnny or whoever it was, they asked that question to show some spiritual interest. We're going to deal with pastoral care accountability. Probably pray for Uncle Johnny right then again, wouldn't we? Hey, pull out your list. Let's pray for them right now. 
Pastoral care accountability is my first agenda anytime I'm meeting a second time with my disciple. Because whatever we covered the first time, we want to review, we want to problem solve, <coughs> ultimately we want to commit again through accountability. I'm going to ask them, they need to know. And it reveals my expectation of them, not just them as a disciple, but my expectation of God to use their prayer and open a door for their witness, for them to be effective, right? That's the first third of our time or the first of three agendas I would have anytime I meet with a disciple. Second agenda or second third of our time. New teaching and practice. Okay? New teaching and practice. Assuming we're moving forward in accountability, they're, they're, pursue, they're, they're growing as a disciple on, based on the things, the disciplines we've offered them previously, we're going to offer them a new teaching and practice, okay? So if by chance, like we said, the same example, previous week was on prayer for their oikos, this week my new teaching might be, hey, in three parts, let's learn how to share your testimony. Look at how... The Samaritan woman did that. Or look at how Paul did that in the book of Acts in his three thirds and three parts. Let's look at that passage together. Let's read it together. Let's, let's think about your testimony in three parts. Your life before, how you met, your life after. Well, tell me that. What was your life like before? Practice. Let me, what about how you met Christ? Second part of your testimony. Practice. What about a third part? Practice. Hey, let me... Let me tell you mine and see if you can hear those three parts in my testimony. Practice. Typically in the middle third, the second agenda, half of my time, whatever time I have, I want to use on teaching, and half of my time I want to use on them practicing that teaching. So the previous week when it was on prayer, yeah, we spent time in Matthew, is it six, isn't it? But yes, you better believe we spent half of our time actually praying your kingdom come, your will be done here on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. We practiced, we put it into play, right? That's our second agenda. And the reason we do that, we want them to grow in competence, new teaching. We want them to grow in confidence so that they would actually go out, not just with some more knowledge, but with the confidence to obey and because we're pursuing that one-to-one -one ratio. What you know, what you obey. Practice is a key element. Guys, the truth is the majority of my ministry, prior to going overseas, prior to, to thinking through what it takes to multiply, as I was even uh, considering and concerned with my own giftings as success, the majority of my ministry, I did a great deal of content dump. I didn't practice. I didn't make the disciples practice, honestly, because I really didn't expect them to go out and reproduce it. When we, if we expect them to do it, we're going to practice with them. Just like any coach, if you expect them to play the game and win the game, guess what you're going to need to do in advance? Practice, right? All right, the last third, the third agenda out of three is planning and commissioning. Does that have two ends in it, planning? Yeah. How about two M's and two S's? Is that right? Planning and commissioning. Okay, good. That would have been embarrassing, huh? Last third, the third part of our meeting, we're going to make plans. So now we've practiced our testimony. They have in, the, in their hand a, a list of non-believers from their family from the previous week. So guess what the plan is? You've been praying for your uncle, cousin, brother, sister, nephew for the last week good job we took account on that we practiced your testimony we saw how paul did his in the new teaching so our plan is what over the next week which ones off of your list of non-believing family members are you going to share your testimony with what day are you going to do it i want to set my watch i want to mark my calendar so I can call you that morning and pray for you. So I can be praying for you even as you sit down with that uncle. It's at lunch on Tuesday? Great, there's a plan. I'll be praying for you. Call me at 1 o'clock when you're done. 
Commissioning, what does that mean? Hey, don't go try to share and win your, your uncle out of the, your own authority, out of your own abilities to share. We've practiced, but remember, you're dependent upon the Holy Spirit of God to give the increase. The unknown doer who gives birth to the seed, right? As we've shared so many times before, let me pray for you to go in the power of the Holy Spirit, to be discerning of his timing and his voice, so you could speak with his authority and that he would open your uncle's heart. Commissioning, right? Go make disciples. Planning and commissioning ought to happen every time we meet with our disciples. They shouldn't go out, but that we're challenging them. Go obey and go with the power of the Holy Spirit. Go with an action plan. Now you see that just like our prayer and our testimony lessons, week one and week two in this example, as we plan and commission, that leads us right back to, into lesson three. And we'll start lesson three, whatever that is, perhaps gospel presentation or otherwise, by asking how to go with your uncle at noon on Tuesday when you sat down for lunch with him and shared a testimony. We're right back into pastoral care accountability. And then we're going to add a new skill, competency. We're going to practice for conference. We're going to make some action plans. And we're going to commission them to go out again. This is T for T. Now throw in church in that. Mix in that as, the, as your church. You put in work okay. in there. This is T for T for a disciple, right? Realize that also when you once you've identified leadership and or representatives of a church, your T for T menu becomes Acts chapter 2. What are the things we want every believer to be doing? What are the things every church should be doing? It's the Acts chapter 2 functions. So there becomes Acts chapter 2 becomes a script for your T for T. So if we have a church that has uh, self-identified Acts 2.41, those who believed were baptized, they're at 3,000, added to their number. They knew who was in and who was out. Now we go down the list of obediences in Acts chapter 2. Those things the church, the first churches were doing to rightly function. We ask ourselves about baptism. We ask ourselves about Lord's Supper, about giving, about loving others and fellowship, about prayer, about going out and so that the Lord would daily add to their numbers about praising God. And the question is, for a church, are those things happening? If so, baptism... Lord's Supper, giving, identifying a local shepherd, 1 Timothy 3, loving each other. Some of those are a little harder to measure. Loving each other. How do you measure a heart motive? Got to get creative in some of that. What other competencies? Are they going out to start another? Right? Worship, prayer. I've seen people draw a little stick figure for prayer. I've seen people talk about a church in worship, evidently, slightly charismatic. <laughs> you with me? Now the question is, are those things facilitated by people outside the church or by the membership, by those who are inside? And again, if they're outside, if baptism is outside, our goal is that that authority should move inside. In which case, baptism becomes the new teaching and the practice that we're going to inject into our T4T T process very soon. Why? We practice for confidence, we plan, we commission, and next time we take an account. And they say, yes, we baptized three. Good job, Rajiv. You're obedient. What you saw, you did. Pastoral care accountability. Let's talk about Lord's Supper this week. Lord's Supper's outside. Our goal is that it's inside. That becomes our new teaching and practice. Why? We're going to be intentional about seeing those church functions, not just provided by the outsider, but that the local church believers are taking up authority because we believe those functions are essential. They're necessary for church health. In that sense, our, our church health mapping becomes a script for T for T. Right? Does that make sense? In some way, the same as the four fields is a script for T for T. It's how we move people into right function. Competence, confidence, commitment, the fruit of a T for T process. Then you're going to worship, you're going to have a discovery Bible study process. Talk a little bit about that. I mean, okay. Whole, if you're, if you're, 
two hours together and you're going to have a church and you do it in a three-thirds format, what's that look like? Okay, let's just throw it out to everybody. If you were assuming we've gone through pastoral care and accountability on the previous lesson, now we're moving into a new teaching on worship. Remember, some of these things are easy to easy to uh, observe, like baptism or Lord's Supper. Yes, they did it. Check, right? Some of those things that are, of course, baptism and Lord's Supper require heart motive also, don't they? Some of those things like love are harder to observe. Yeah, they gave. Were they giving out of a right motive? Yeah, they worshipped. Were they worshipping out of a right motive? So we don't, if I was going to introduce a new teaching on worship, what passage would I use? What passage would you use? You put me on a spot. I'm, <laughs> I'm pushing it back. What passage would you use to introduce worship? They go to the Mount of Transfiguration. Okay. Mount of Transfiguration. All right. Good. Any others? So you could, in a story format, you could introduce... Peter, James, and John being led onto the mountain where the glory of the Jesus Christ is revealed. And even those Old Testament figures, Moses and Elijah, are serving him. Right? Okay. How about Matthew 22? A man In a story format, a man comes to Jesus. Tell me, what's the most important law in all of, the, in all of Moses? And what does he say? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. If we put, take both synoptics, right? And love your neighbor as yourself. Guys, how do we love God? What do we call it when we're loving God? It's not just singing, right? Isn't worship loving God? Well, how do we love God? Well, there's a number of passages we need to deal with. If you love me, you will keep my commandments, Jesus said, right? In which case, we've got to dive into John and deal with that passage. Obedience is worship, okay? Public profession is worship. You are glorious, you, and so singing has a role. Even for that matter, if I was going to introduce worship, I might also, for that matter, link it to Lord's Supper. Hopefully it's something we've dealt with previously. George Patterson would say that's actually how you introduce worship to new believers. This is his body, this is his bread, or this is his blood. You want to introduce worship? You could translate a songbook or you could take a cup and a loaf of bread and take a shortcut to understanding worship, right? There's any number of passages you could plug in to teach and, and introduce new believers to worship. But remember, motive is hard to measure. How do you practice those things? There needs to be real time, not just instruction, but some type of experiential, some type of uh, communal practice where they together, corporately, uh, put that discipline into practice, right? And so whether that's uh, deciding how they'll use their offering as a form of worship, taking the Lord's Supper, writing a new song, praying and, and publicly declaring, reading a psalm and celebrating its truth, right? Many ways to do it. So I, And what you think that through, because planning and commissioning, how are they going to incorporate worship into their daily life? Okay. So I'm, I'm getting how you're introducing all these topics and all. Let's say you've introduced these topics, you've had uh, training in it, and now are you still carrying this three-thirds process to be your church service, or are you adding some vision at the front end and some... You know, some music, what, what, what would you look like as your church service, yeah. if you the, Even in pioneer contexts, we talk about, and for that matter, Steve Smith, Ying Kai, I'm sure I imagine, talk about a very pure model where there's the, the three-thirds and there's parts under the thirds, including worship and other things that, that become a script for a new church start. I agree 100%. I'm totally good with that. That ought to be the way it is. That every church service, every time we meet with disciples, right? Church services can be led by these three same three-thirds. There ought to be public testimony and accountability among the body. There ought to be prayer for that struggle that they're facing, pastoral care. There ought to be new teaching. We ought to be incorporating practice among the believers because the Ephesians 4 leaders of the church 
are there to equip the saints for the works of ministry. Not the professional priesthood that we so often bemoan, right? Mm -hmm. And for that matter, there ought to be planning and commissioning. And or different descriptors you would use under that. Vision casting and other things in the original T for T book. Those very legitimately can be a script for a church meeting. Even when there's not, you're not in a traditional setting, even when you're in a pioneer setting, realize that you're going to face, there will be traditions introduced. You're going to face where we serve the God TV channel that pipes in, let's just say, some other DNA <laughs> or other ideas of success, right? They're going to come in contact with other believers in their con country or context who will show them different things. So good luck keeping a guitar out of your church service, right? Mm -hmm. Good luck keeping in some ways. Now, I'm about to say something that might sound a little funny on video because, in fact, my first calling, uh, in the presence of God and Christ Jesus will judge the living and the dead, preach the word, in season, out of season, correct, rebuke, encourage, with great patience, careful instruction, with time come, people not put up, sound out. That's my first calling, preach the word, right? And yet, when we introduce, introduce and come among new believers, we're wanting to introduce a participative Bible study method. That seems a little strange, particularly when you're coming from the calling that the Lord used to break your heart and give yourself to Him in ministry. Still my first, hopefully my gifting. So what do I do with that? Well, my goal is to do participative format so that in a new group of believers, I don't have to profile for the educated guy and say, you're going to lead. No, I can offer them questions from the Word, and week after week we start to see one brother emerge or who clearly the Lord is showing him truth in Scripture. And typically, it's not who I anticipated or expected. Well, that ought to be a clue for me that that person is most likely the emerging pastor-teacher gift that the Lord intends for and is given among them, potentially. If that's the case, my participative study format, the denial of my own gifting to an impulse to stand up and preach the word, in some ways, it's helped me to identify the local leader and push him forward. I'm going to pull that person to the side, start doing prep ahead of time. But now here's the reality, and I say all that as a commercial. Hopefully that's the way it goes. The reality is people like me can only suppress that gift for so long. And that young guy, perhaps, he's read 2 Timothy 4 too, and he's, he's going to break out. And am I okay with that? Yeah, I'm okay with that. That's, I, I don't know that I can stop it, even no matter how hard I try. Sometimes traditions, even the form of content delivery, that flow from our nature, that flow from his calling even, mm -hmm. are going to begin to overshadow some of these things. And so church service, realize though, church service can be dominated by worship and by teaching and you can still do T for T on the side. You can still have a venue for, for training others. Is that fair? Yeah, well, it, it's just reality. Our experience maybe. is that, you know, even in the participative stuff, there's occasionally a night somebody just stands up and 20 minutes, thus saith the Lord. Yeah. And it just came out of a flow of being in the Word that week, the flow of what was yeah. going on. Sometimes it's me. But, okay. it's, it's, but you don't really know. But it is, you still, but there's, we still do the participative, but it's still, there's right. definitely the thus saith the Lord moments. Right. Or it's my daughter, the prophet steps up and <laughs> hellfire and damnation, need to repent and believe in Jesus, you know, yeah. so. Yeah, well, we, we put in a very intentional script to break some habits, typically some tradition, and try to implement these things. This can also become a habit and a tradition as well. And if the Spirit wants to use a young man to, for thus saith the Lord, who am I to say no? All right, thanks.